you were in a different set last week. I wonder what Nick says about it. Have you? He's been living with a 14-year-old this week. That's have funny. you? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this uh, morning, and uh, I didn't get around to greet everybody, but hey, we are so glad that you are here. I got caught up talking to too many people, imagine that, so um, they were telling me it's time for worship. When you haven't seen anybody in forever, it's like, hey, a family reunion, isn't it? Um, so I want to make a few announcements, different things that are going on uh, in the life of the church. The first is uh, that the women's Bible study will start in here Wednesday night. Um, so sign up. You can call the church. You can talk to Barbara. And uh, she says they've already got a pretty good number signed up. But there will be plenty of space in here um, to spread out. So, um, And that starts at 6. Is it at 6, Barbara? At 6 o'clock. So get here a little bit before so we can get seated and get all that stuff done. The other thing is maybe you saw Miss Beth this week uh, somewhere on Facebook or something. Um, Trying out for the B movie, maybe you saw it, and that is part of our virtual yes. So Beth has been on this conference group that is putting together uh, this virtual BBS, and that virtual VBS will be from July 13th through the 17th. You can talk to Beth or go on the conference to sign up. And um, finally, this afternoon we will be meeting with our confirmation. Um, we weren't going to meet because it's Father's Day, but we are so far really behind. And then we're going to give them off July the 5th, um, but we need to get them to a place. So we'll be meeting out in the gardens. Uh, we met last week, had our first week back, and had all but one there. So it was a, a, a good time um, for that. So welcome to worship. We thank you so much um, for what you have to go through to come to worship. We thank you for your social distancing and all that you're doing. And um, just thank you for being here. So let's pray. God, we come to you now. And we thank you so much for another opportunity to come into the house of the Lord. To be able to worship together cooperatively. God, it's just so good to see faces. And God, we know we're living in some very trying times. God, we're living in a... Time that is saturated with story after story. And so, God, we're just trying to make sense of everything that's going on around us. But, God, I just pray now that we would push all that aside. And that we would just spend some time with you. God, that your presence and your Holy Spirit would come upon us. And just for this hour, 45 minutes, whatever it is, 
that we could feel some peace, that we could feel your peace. And God, that we could feel connected to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Faith of our fathers. We'll sing all verses.
you may be seated and let's join together in this affirmation of our Christian faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. we come to our um, pastoral prayers and um, want to mention some that um, had procedures and different things done this week. The first is uh, Doyce uh, Reeves. Doyce uh, had some issues with his feet and he had that taken care of, um, but then he was experiencing some extreme pain and some other things. And so he found himself back um, in the hospital this week. So we want to pray for him. Um, then uh, Trish Latham, I got a chance to talk to her last week. Um, she is still having some respiratory issues uh, associated with pneumonia, and so we want to pray for her. Pete Lockhart had, um, they did have to do uh, bypass surgery. He wound up having three bypass. Um, but when I called the day after, he was up and walking down the hall, so that is a good thing. Um, and so, uh, we continue to pray for him. And then Fran Wells um, passed away this week, and we do not have details yet. David and I were actually doing some investigating this morning to see if we could figure it out, but we don't have details on that. But as soon as we do, we will get them out and get them published in case um, people want to know what the plan for that is. So... Continue to pray for, you know, our world in a place of unrest and different things that were going on and just different places and different pockets. I also want to be in, in, in prayer for a lot of our churches. Um, a lot of our churches that are smaller and, and different places are coming back to worship today. I noticed that a lot of them have pushed back. And so pray for them. There's a lot of anxiousness um, in, in doing that and uh, pray for them so, you know, the, the, the prayers of the world, and, and, and I, I ask everybody if, you know, if the best thing to do right now in today's world is, is take about 15 minutes. You can put it on an egg timer. You can put it on, on your phone, whatever you want to put it on, and just spend 15 minutes in prayer um, every day and just make a list of things. Uh, I have this little blue notebook that I keep all these notes on, and it just looks like chicken scratch, but that's kind of what I pray over and what I do. Um, but spend that time, you know, just really praying for what's going on. And the reason I tell you that is because it'll help center you. And, and when it helps to center you, you, you have a different uh, take and, and attitude towards what's going on around you. So with that being said, um, let's pray. God, we come to you this morning, first of all, thankful for the opportunity to worship. Thankful for this building, this building that represents your house. And God, we're just so thankful to have this place. God, we're so thankful to see the people who long for worship. God, we were made to worship. And God, when we don't worship, when we don't connect with you, it's what brings up so much emptiness in our life. God, you know the prayer concerns this morning. We pray for the world in general. And God, not just the United States, because 
We're not the only ones that are going through this. God, this is what they call global. And God, it is, there is death everywhere. There is unrest everywhere. And so God, I just pray now that everybody would just breathe. That everybody would just talk to you. And that everybody would be able to find peace. Peace within themselves. And once we find that inner peace, it truly is contagious. God, we pray for the family of Fram Wells. We pray for Doyce. We pray for Trish. We pray for Pete and Dee as they're going through this. And so, God, we ask a special blessing upon each one of those. And, God, that they feel the power of the Holy Spirit right now as we pray for them. God, we know there are others in our church that are awaiting tests. There are others that are very fearful now because they don't feel quite like themselves. and They just wonder. So, God, I pray that you'd be with them. That you would calm the fears and anxieties. God, I believe that's what Jesus taught us in the Lord's Prayer. And now let us pray that prayer with the confidence that you taught your disciples to pray. Saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. And the power. And the glory. Forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Our hymn of preparation this morning is we've a story to tell to the nations. We'll sing verses 1 and 4. close Holy Spirit as the scriptures are read and the word is proclaimed let the word of faith be on our lips and in our hearts and let all the other words slip away may there be one voice we hear today the voice of truth and grace amen now I hear a reading from Acts chapter 15 beginning with verse 22 then the apostles and the elders with the consent of the whole church decided to choose men from among their members and to send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They sent Judas called Bersabbas and Silas, leaders among the brothers. Then they skip, we skip down to verse 25. We have decided unanimously to choose representatives and send them to you along with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. And now verse 28. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to impose on you no further burden than these essentials. 
This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you so much, Susan. I love that song, and you did a wonderful job. 
Well, during this moment in our worship, we again uh, celebrate the fact that everyone has been so faithful and diligent in their giving and supporting the church, the mission, and the ministry near and far, and enabling us to come back together in such a way. Uh, just a reminder, we have the um, offering plates at the door. You can drop your offering in before or after worship. You can give online, you can mail a check, or you can set up charitable giving through your place of employment. Uh, let's have a prayer, and then we'll have our off offertory. Gracious God, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for uh, the people that make up this body of Christ, this community of faith right here. We thank you, God, for the ways that you enable us to continue to live out our vows through our witness, uh, through our presence, through our prayers, through our gifts and our service. We thank you for all the ways that we can be your hands and your feet in this community and beyond. And we pray, God, that you'll just bless the gifts that have been given. Help us to continue to do the work you have called us to. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for that. What an awesome and fitting song for this time. And, and I think that is a, boy, I don't even really need to preach after that, to be honest with you. People need the Lord. Um, but I'm going to anyway, because I wrote this out, and I might as well go ahead and get it done. Isn't that right? So we, we've been talking about being anxious for nothing. And um, our, our kind of our verse that we've kind of taken from that. And, and what's funny is when you're preaching and when you're planning and when you're doing stuff, you'll see this pop up in different places. And it may be in a book you're reading. It may be in a morning devotion that you're doing. Um, but that's kind of what's happened um, during this series. And um, that verse comes from Philippians 4, 6. Once again, it says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Be anxious for nothing, but pray. Be anxious for nothing, but pray. It's interesting because, once again, I think we've mentioned this, but where we find Paul writing this letter is, is, is in Rome. Now, here's the funny thing about it. Paul had always wanted to go to Rome, but he didn't want to go to Rome this way. In other words, he never got to truly present the gospel in Rome, but that had always been his dream, so to speak. And if you follow his journeys and you follow the different things that he's on, um, you'll realize that he kind of saved this as his Farewell kind of speech is, is, is kind of, that's what he wanted to do. Um, but he finds himself on house arrest. Now, I don't know about you, um, but I don't know that under house arrest, 
I'm going to be able to write, do not be anxious about anything. Number one, most of us don't like to be out of control. Most of us long to have control. Right now, I'm teaching my third child how to drive. Okay? Um, He's really not that bad um, because he has driven four-wheelers and golf carts and boats and whatever else his whole life. Um, He does like to stay closer to the mayonnaise than the mustard. We have to get on that all the time. Um, You know, you don't need to hug the right side, but other than that... But the most anxious part of teaching him to drive is I find myself doing, I think, what my parents do and having this fake break down here and clutching like this sometimes, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about? And and here's the problem with it. The problem is not his driving. The problem is I'm not in control. And that's where most of the time we find ourselves. When we're out of control, we become anxious. And so I cannot even fathom how Paul wrote, be anxious for nothing while under house arrest. But I will tell you why he wrote that. Because God knew long before we were to find ourselves in this time. He's the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. And the words of the scripture contain what we need to get to the other side. Be anxious for nothing. Now last week we talked about the perspective of praise in the midst of anxiety. And today I kind of want to go along with something we talked about in Plan B. Now in Plan B, which was our sermon series before, I kind of grazed over this, but today I want to go a little bit more in depth with it. And this is where we talk about decisions that lead to anxiety. Now, I don't care who you are, if you're sitting in this room, you have had to make decisions in your life that caused you to be anxious. Either those decisions leading up to making the decision, or after the decision, being very anxious about what we have done. I'll be honest with you, in the last four months, we've had to make decisions within the church, and it, 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 we've been anxious. Did we do the right thing? You know, it, it's just, it's, we've never seen anything like it. And so we're finding ourselves trying to make decisions for the greater good of everyone. But sometimes being blocked or sometimes going, did I do it right? See, what happens in the world today is that we actually, you ready for this? Have too much information and that leads us to think through too many of our decisions. It used to be we just make them, right? And live with the consequences. Now I'm going to be honest with you. The number one anxiety-driven question in my house is this. Where do you want to eat? (laughs) Come on now. Some of y'all wanted to file for divorce over that question. Now add kids to that and add this or that and add now the stress that you can't really get in a restaurant and you're going, where do you want to eat? Here, here's the conversation, you ready? I don't know. Well, how about we go here? I don't like that place. Well, you just said you didn't care, but I care if we go there. Well, how about we go there? No, we went there last week. But you said you didn't care. You see, now we're getting anxious, right? The anxiety has built upon itself. Let me tell you another argument in my house. You ready? Who's dressing ever this morning? (laughs) Don't put that on her. We want her to be the best dressed kid at the day school, don't we? Where'd you get that? Don't her hair looks terrible. Quit that. Now listen, I jokingly say that, but the truth is, 
that part of the problem, and this is especially true of the younger generation, is they have way too many choices. And we've always thought that choices were good things. But the truth is, maybe it's because we have so many choices that lead to being so anxious. See, the truth is it's not about content. It's about making the right decision. I used this example before, but it's as true as it can be. If you come up to me and say, hey, Steve, you, I, I need you to deliver a message. And you have 10 minutes to deliver that message. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. That's not a, that's not a problem. I love to talk. As a matter of fact, I was a senior superlative in high school. I've never told you all this. Uh, I was most talkative. There you go. <laughs> Runner-up class clown, most talkative. There you go. So I, I can talk. That's not what brings me anxiousness. What brings me anxiousness is if you go, if I ask you and I say, well, what do you want me to talk about? And you go, I don't know. And why is that so anxious? Because I have so much to choose from. It's not the content. It's making the right decision. And part of our life and where we are and where we get to this is that we want to make sure we make the right decision. You know, you think about now. I'll never forget when... when, when Lily was a, a senior and we went to her award ceremony. There was this one student that I think applied to every college in the United States. Like they finally just told him, just stay up on stage because we're tired of watching you walk around. And I thought, how in the world with all the scholarship and all the money, are they going to decide? It's almost like they have too many choices. And too many choices. And now they're asking the question, what school is right? And and so we have to make all these decisions that we could never make before. Do I buy a car? Do I lease a car? Do I buy a house? Do I rent a house? Because I don't know how long I might stay. Because I have a job here, but if I get an offer, do I move? Do I stay here? Do I stay there? And the problem is we have so many things to do and to decide that we become overwhelmed. And so you know what we do? We don't decide anything. But by prayer and petition. So this week I go to celebrate six months from my knee surgery. So it's been six months since... um, since I had my surgery, and I was doing my rehab across the street over here, and I, I didn't have to do rehab very long um, because I, I, I really did a lot on my own. Um, and so uh, I was in there, and there was a girl who was working with my rehab one day, and uh, she goes to the church next door. I learned out a, a lot about her. Her parents were missionaries. Um, once again, I love to talk, so if you're going to work on my knee, uh, I'm, you're also going to pay for my talking time. Like, you're, we're going to do it, right? Um, and so one day I walked in, and it's probably the second or third time I had seen her, and I could just tell something was going on with her. Like, discernment is my top spiritual gift, so if something bothers you and you look at me and you talk to me, I can almost read it in your eyes. And so this day I looked at her and I said, what's going on with you today? Now, you know what answer most people give with that, right? Oh, nothing. It's all right. I said, no, don't, 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 don't lie to the preacher. Don't, don't do that. You'll go to hell for that. Don't do that. <laughs> Tell me what's going on. And she looked at me and she said, man, I just got a big decision to make. I said, well, what's the decision? If you don't mind me asking, because I'll tell you what, while I'm sitting here doing whatever you got me doing, we'll pray about it. Right? Because I can't move. And you're going to put me on this ice thing. It's like a boa constrictor on my leg, right? And she says, well, I got an opportunity to go to Australia because that's where the number one physical therapy school is in the United States. And I got to, or not in the United States, in the world. And I can go. But if I go, you ready for this decision? She wasn't married. I cannot take my dog with me. I have to get my dog up. Most people were thinking, 
That's an easy decision, but not for her. She's not married. And that dog is her family. Now, COVID helped her to make that decision. But do you see the complexity of decisions? And so we prayed about it. And I told her, I said, what will happen is you will know through prayer, not through emotion, the right thing to do. See, the other thing we cannot allow in our life is we cannot allow our decisions to be emotionally driven. See, Jesus set the best example of not making emotional decisions. I want to give you three. Three things that said, that Jesus said, here's what I want to do. Here's where I want to think about. And here's where I want it to come. Here are some examples. Luke 9. Listen to the story. And he sent messengers on ahead who went into the Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples James and John saw this. I love this verse, by the way. They're known as sons of thunder. Those two. You ready for this? Here it is. Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and destroy them? Here are the disciples asking Jesus, look, they don't accept us. So I'll tell you what we do. Let's just wipe them out, right? You know what Jesus says? Jesus said, we ain't going to start no riot. We're not going to protest this. You know what we're going to do? We're going to shake the dust off our feet and move to another place. Because he wasn't emotionally driven by the decision. He prayed through the decision. Knowing that calling down thunder would only cause more unrest, more discord. The second is this. Find this in Luke. Very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Notice what he does. Remember what I talked to you about 15 minutes? I don't know how long he spent. But this was a ritual for him. Now listen, if our Lord and Savior Jesus needs to pray through decisions, shouldn't we? Here, here's the rest of it. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and they found him, and they explained, Jesus, everyone is looking for you. So let me give you the context of this. So what had happened was, this was the day after Jesus had fed all the people. And the people now see they've got somebody to take care of their needs. They finally found that Messiah. Maybe not the Messiah they were looking for as Savior, but Messiah that can provide for them here on earth. And he looks at them, and here's what, he, here's what they say. Let's go get him. Let's give him all our trust. Here's what Jesus does. Jesus goes, hey, Peter, load everybody up. We're going to the next town. Do you understand? We got what you're looking for, Jesus. Yeah, but we're not going to drive this emotionally. We're going to do what the Lord has called us to do. Finally, we look at Mark 1, Mark 1, 38. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby abilities so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. He traveled through Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Once again, what happens is he's gained this popularity and everybody's wanting to come see him and they're waiting at the house and he says, you know what? Let's go. I've got other work to do. And then finally, his last emotional that wasn't driven emotionally was what I said to y'all last week. It's how we ended the service. As he hung on the cross, he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. See, the truth is, emotional decisions are usually bad decisions. When we are driven by emotions and not by the scripture, that lands us in hot water. And I can attest to that. 
There are so many things I wish I could take back. And all of it was because it was emotional. All of it was mostly because somebody said something or did something that triggered anger in my life. I have two gears. Nice as can be or mad as can be. And I have to pray through that so that I don't go into that one gear. Because that taints my witness. And it ruins my testimony. And if I drive that through emotional things, then what do I do? So here's what I've done. So I've set this up. Now I want to give you some points. I want to give you some practical points on how to develop the skills of not making emotional decisions, but making good decisions. We're going to go through these very quickly. The first is this. Avoid either or or decisions. In other words, sometimes the best thing to do is throw a third choice in there. We were looking to buy Laura a safe car. We were looking at one brand of car and we went to the lot and um, they had several of the different models that we were going to drive and we drove one and I thought, man, I don't really like this. And we drove another and she said, well, I have another option. And the other option is this other car. And so we drove two or three of those. And it was like driving an army tank. And I'm like, how in the world does this get good reviews? And so you know what we did? We went with the third option. And that's what we wound up buying. It wasn't even on our radar. But it was the safest. It had third world seat. All the things that we needed to take the little girl around town. Right? So when we think about these things, when we look at these things, don't go either or. And then don't be scared to ask other people, what did you do? Doesn't mean you have to follow them, but avoid the uh, either or. Avoid decision fatigue. I thought it was funny, David and I were talking about this this week, and I, I, I thought I was giving David some knowledge, um, but then he looked at me and goes, man, I already knew that. But uh, anyway, <laughs> which is most of the, um, But we were talking about people that uh, are on the parole board. And... People that are in a parole hearing will, will hear numerous cases during the day. Now, if you're a parolee, I hope you never get there. I will come visit you if you let me. But, um, no, nah, don't go there. Um, but anyway, if you have to be in front of a parole board, you want to go in the morning. Because you are what percentage? What was it, David? Like 70-something percentage more to get paroled if you're in the morning than the afternoon. You want to know Why? Decision fatigue. People get tired of making decisions. You know how people say, I'll wait till the night to make a decision? Wait till the next morning. Give it 24 hours. Because in a given day, you're going to make between three and 5,000 decisions. And by the end of the day, you're wiped out. You have decision fatigue. And when you get decision fatigue, you don't always make great decisions. So the first is avoid either or, and the second is decision fatigue. The next is become your own advisor. So Craig Rochelle was doing this leadership conference, and he was talking about they had this staff member, and they had moved this staff member to four different positions. They loved this staff member, but wherever the staff member went, the staff member could not thrive. And so they would move him, and they really liked the guy. And finally, he sits down one day, and he goes, you know what? I've got to make a decision. And so here's what he did. He went to a counselor, and the counselor says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about it like this. I want you to step outside of yourself and become your own advisor. Here's what he said. So if a new pastor was coming on board that did not know this guy that you know that you have a relationship with, would he hire him or keep him on staff? He became his own advisor. And even though he loved the guy, he had to move him. See, sometimes we've got to step out and ask the question, not what would I do, but what would someone who came in behind me or somewhere else do? 
That helps us become our own advisor. It helps us to make our own decision. We ask these questions when we become our own personal advisor. What would a great leader do? Because great leaders are not scared to make decisions that are unpopular. The second question we ask is, what would my successor do? So the first is avoid either or. The second is avoid decision fatigue. The third is become your own personal advisor. And here's the fourth. Decide when you're going to decide and decide. If you have something that is really pressing on you, set a date. Set a time. Some people say, in a job where you're very busy, it's best to make decisions towards the end of the week. So if you work really hard through the first of the week, for us, it's preparing Bible studies, it's preparing PowerPoints, it's preparing sermons, it's reading, it's doing all that. But by the time Thursday gets here, we better be finished with that stuff. At least we hope to be. So a good time to make decisions is around Thursday. So set a time, set a date, and say this is what we're going to do and this is when we're going to decide. And that will cut your anxieties. Because at least then you know the date you have to make the decision. Now here's the point to that. Once you've made the decision, let it go. Let it go. See, here, here's the same problem with decisions as our faith in Jesus. We give it to him and then we pick it back up. We give it to him and then we take it back. Uh-uh. Give it to him and leave it. Go to bed. Knowing that you set the date, you prayed through it. Through prayer and petition, you came to the answer and let it go. And finally, here's the one that other people will, will disagree with sometimes. But I think there's a spiritual edge to every decision that's ever made. I truly do. I think every decision we make affects the kingdom of God. I really do. I, I think in looking at my life and where I'm at, had I not made the decisions I made, I wouldn't be where I am today. And the reason is not by coincidence. The reason is by the power of the Holy Spirit. Those are two totally different things. Two totally different things. There is a spiritual edge to every decision you make because every decision you make, believe me, affects someone else. And not only does it affect someone else, it affects the kingdom of God. Quick recap. Expand the options to avoid either or scenarios. Be careful about decision fatigue. Sometimes delegate your decisions. Don't make all the decisions. Look, I've worked for two kinds of people. I've worked for those that are micromanagers, and I've worked for those that are hands-off. And I like those that are somewhere in between there. Finally, become your own personal advisor. What would you tell yourself if you were to give advice on this situation? Pick and decide when you're going to choose or make a decision. And finally, pray, 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 then listen. Listen for God to speak. Because there's a spiritual edge to every decision you make. Look, making decisions is anxious. And we're living in anxious times. But Paul says, be anxious for nothing. And you know why he could say that? So I was talking to Lily the other day, and Lily's getting ready to move to Auburn in, in August. Lily's got this real spiritual side to her. And she looked at me and I said, well, you're going to go out on your own and, you know, are you worried about, you know, the COVID? Are you worried about what's going on? And she looked at me and she said, Dad, if there's one thing you've taught me, 
It's that if it's my time to go, I know where I'm going. Bam, my job is done. She knows where she's going. And she says, I'm not anxious because I got Jesus. We're not anxious because we got Jesus. Let's pray. God, as we come this morning, we hear how to make decisions. God, it's an emotional time in our world. So many decisions have to be made. Do I do this? Do I do that? There are people making decisions for us. God, my question has always been, have, we, have, have they even went into prayer before they make a decision? Have they even consulted and asked you? God, really being anxious for nothing is being secure in our salvation in our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. God, I love it that you sent your son Jesus to give his life for us. God, if there's someone here today that's never asked Jesus into their heart, I pray today's that day. God, there doesn't need to be any bells and whistles, no thrills. It's simply asking Jesus to come into your heart and to help you make Decisions in this anxious time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our hymn of dedication is Go Make of All Disciples. We'll sing all verses. shall bring God's kingdom here. Isn't that what the power of the Holy Spirit does? Isn't that what really being a Christian is all about? It's not about buying an insurance policy. It's about bringing heaven here. Let's pray. God, as we go now, go with us. God, we all have decisions to make. We're all very anxious about many things. But God, in the scripture, it says be anxious for nothing. Because the one decision you made was the decision to redeem us all by giving your one and only son, Jesus Christ, 
who came as a sacrifice and gave his life as a ransom for me and for my sin. God, I put my trust in Jesus. And God, my prayer is that everyone who hears this will do the same. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.